Hey guys, in this video I'm going to prove the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1. So uh, proving it means why is this actually true? What is the kind of the math that goes into this? So I'm going to build all that up. So first things first, if you actually think about this limit, so this is kind of a surprising result. It, it's actually a theorem and it's a surprising one because if you plug in 0, you get 0 over 0, which we usually know is that that's like a no-no with limits, right? So it's kind of odd actually just looking at this that we get one as the limit that, that doesn't make immediate sense. So I'm gonna actually show you why this works and I'm gonna use kind of a, a strange path to get there. It might feel strange, but eventually we will get back to this theorem. So just kind of hang on here. So to begin, let's think about basic trig ideas. So one of the most basic things in trig is the unit circle. Okay. So we're going to start with the unit circle and more specifically I want to focus on this quadrant in the unit circle so let's just blow that up. And from here now what I want to do is I want to think about triangles. So I'm going to, I'm going to create this random point P here. Um, so it could be really any point as long as it's somewhere in that quadrant. And then I'm going to take the point that's actually on the unit circle so we'll call that point U. And then we'll also take the origin um, and we'll call that point O. So I've got kind of the, these three points and from here what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line from O to P and I'm going to now consider how could we make triangles kind of from this. Now there are actually several ways you can create triangles kind of using this line here as a guiding point and then kind of using these points here to help guide you. There, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to show you the, the three relevant shapes that we really need for this proof. So if the one that you were thinking of wasn't on there, um, it's not that it, that's not one of the triangles. It's just it's we need like a specific three for this to work. OK, so the first one we're going to make by connecting P to U like this. And we're going to call this triangle one. So here it all is filled in. So there's there's our triangle one. Okay, so our next one is going to be this big one, and we're actually going to just clear right through that point P to make this giant triangle. So we'll call this triangle three, so there it is all filled in just so that we're all clear. And then the last one that we're going to take is not a true triangle, so I'm going to call it triangle-ish, <laughs> triangle-ish two, and I have filled in the area that I'm specifically referring to. So it's really more like a wedge of the circle. But just to keep the naming straight, just go with me here. Let's just call it triangle two for now. We know that it's not a triangle, but just go with me. It makes my naming convention easier, okay? Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Note how the triangles are triangle-ish, how they all relate in size. So I have that, that first one, so there was my triangle one, and then I have that, that triangle-ish two that kind of lays there, and then I've got triangle three. So just by kind of inspecting how these all relate to one another, we can create an inequality. So the area of the first one is definitely the smallest. The, the area of triangle two is definitely in the middle and then triangle three was definitely the biggest. So there's an inequality kind of relating those three things. Okay, so here's where it's kind of like, all right, what does this have to do? We were, weren't we trying to prove this? What are you doing, you crazy lady? <laughs> and um, so this is all going somewhere. So we actually have to kind of use this to eventually get us to that proof. And noticing this and thinking about just what I have to do with limits, the fact that I have this set of inequalities should kind of give you a hint as to maybe what we're going to use at some point in this proof we probably want to use the squeeze or sandwich theorem, right? So usually when you have a set of inequalities like that, that's what we want to do. Okay, so we don't totally know how this all relates to itself yet, but we'll get there. Um, so what I want to do now is I, I want to think about area of each triangle, okay? So let's start with the first one. And so first things first, it's just a plain old triangle, right? So area of a triangle, one half base times height, no problem. And then if, as I kind of inspect this and I just think about what I know about the unit circle. So I know that this length here, this length is one. And then, well, I can also say this length here is also one, right? Because it's the unit circle. And now just thinking about how does this information help me? Well, this length, at least I can, I can plug into the base, right? This is the base of the triangle. I don't know where I'm going to use this yet, but we'll get there. So 
let's plug this at least into the base. So I've got this. Okay, so I'm, I'm making my way towards getting to the area. So now I have to think about the height. So we'll just call this little line segment here, we'll think of this green part as H, okay? All right, so if I'm trying to get to the height, um, I don't see maybe like a clear way to do that um, with these lengths. So I have to think about what I know about trig. And if I now think about the fact that this side, if I call this angle theta, this is where I'm gonna kind of come up with what the area has to be. So looking at what I know here, I've got this angle and I know this length and I'm trying to figure this out. What trig function would help me do that? Well, that would be sine. And with sine, you've got the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I can figure out the height that that will be what this is if I can figure out kind of some information about these. And so the hypotenuse in this case, that's the length of one. So I'm going to plug one into the hypotenuse. Now, I don't know what this part here, the opposite is. But I did call this H, right? That's what we've been calling this. We said that this was H. So I can at least fill that in and see what I've got. So I have now replaced those things in my formula. So now I've got the opposite was H and the hypotenuse was one. And this gets me kind of close enough, actually, um, just for a general idea about the formula. So H over one is just equal to H. So this actually means then that my H is equal to sine of theta. So all right, that's that's actually good enough. So I can plug that into my H in the formula. So there it is. And if I multiply those things together, what this means then is that my area is equal to one half times sine of theta. All right, so we, we've come up with a, a good enough formula for this, all right? So moving on to the next triangle. So let's, let's take a look at this next one. All right, so it's still a triangle, so I can still use one half base times height. And now as I kind of think about what do I know about this particular triangle, so looking at this, we can totally fill that side in, right? So that's going to be a length of one. Cool. So once again, I'm going to plug this at least into the base because I, I can. So now, once again, I've got to figure out my height. And we're going to use kind of a similar trick to last time, right? So once again, let's think of this as theta. Here's my height. And so now in this case, I don't know what the hypotenuse is, right? But I do know this length, and now I'm trying to figure out the height here. So now you have to think about what, what trig function would actually relate kind of this side with this one. And in this case, that would be tangent, opposite over, ad over adjacent. All right. So once again, now I can kind of fill in what I've got here. So we said that this adjacent was length one, so that's gonna go here. And then once again, I don't know what this is, so I'll at least just call this H and then kind of see where I can go from there. So I've, I've replaced those. And so now I've got H over one, and that will just simplify then to just H, right? So now I got, have got something that I can fill in for H, just tangent of theta. Once again, I'm just gonna plug that right into the formula. So now I get that this formula is really one half times one times tangent of theta. And if I multiply those things together, so then I get that my area is just one half times tangent of theta. Okay, so we're moving right along here. So now for kind of the tricky one, this area of the triangle-ish, triangle two, that's what we're calling it. All right, so it's not a triangle, right? This is really just part of a circle. And if I'm trying to get to area, then I should really think about area of a circle. So area of a circle we know is pi r squared. Now, this region, though, is not going to be pi r squared, right? This is just part of the circle. So you now want to think about how do you represent part of a circle? Well, if the entirety of the circle all the way around, at least this circle, is 2 pi, then to get to this little wedge of it, how would I represent that? Well, this, this little wedge here, this is theta over 2 pi of the circle, right? So that, that's how you would represent that fractional proportion. So using that then, I'm, I'm going to take basically that portion of the circle and then multiply that by the area. So here's kind of where we're at. And you can see now by multiplying those things together, the pi's will drop out. So I can simplify all of this to be pi, uh, theta over two times r squared. But we can go a little further with this, right? Because we know what the radius is. The radius is um, just equal to 
one, right? Because it is the unit circle, so r equals one. So now, why don't I just restate this then by filling in that one, and now I can simplify all of this. So if I multiply all that together, I get theta over two, and I'm running out of room here, so I'll just put a little box around it and say, so here's the area of that triangle-ish, not really, really, wedge of a circle is more proper now, but you, you get what I'm going, going with this. Okay, so, all right, oof, well now we have, we have all the areas, so we're good to go. Okay, so just a reminder, we are trying to prove this. <laughs> we still don't really know where this is coming in, but it, it's coming up now. We're going to get there. So thinking about what we know, um, we know that these three areas are related like this, and we found all the area formulas. So those are my area formulas. Now, notice that all of these are, they all have one half in them, so I'd like to get rid of those just because that's just kind of noise in this case. So I'm going to multiply everything by 2 to get rid of the one halves. So I just get sine of theta is less than or equal to theta, which is um, less than or equal to tangent of theta. And now the next thing I just want to notice here. So I've got sine of theta is less than or equal to, the, I'm just going to restate tangent. That's all I did in this line. So tangent now is sine of uh, theta over cosine of theta. Okay, so now here's where the theorem really matters. So looking at this line here, so compare this to what we actually wanted to prove. So I, I put this in terms of x's right now. We've got this in terms of thetas, but we can, we can just manipulate this to be what we need it to be. So I really need something um, in this case to be something like sine of theta over theta. And at the moment, I'm not quite there yet. However, I've got this theta here. So what we need to do is we need to manipulate this inequality so that we can kind of get the expression that we need. And if you think about the sandwich theorem, you probably want the thing in the middle to be the thing that we're trying to prove. So to do that, then what I'd like to do is divide everything by sine of theta. And so in doing that, so think about how each part of this is, is going to, to simplify. So this is going to become 1, and then I've got theta over sine of theta, and then 1 over cosine of theta. So this is like so close to what I need now. So now I'm going to use a property of inequalities, which says that you can take, if you take the reciprocal of everything, you can just flip the sign of the inequality and it'll still be true. And so now I've actually really got this where I need this. So here's kind of the final expression that I'm left with. And now I can start using the, the squeeze theorem on this. Okay, so starting with, we'll, we'll start with the endpoints. So let's start with one. So the limit as theta approaches zero of, of any constant is just the constant itself. So this will just be one. And then, so the limit is uh, theta approaches zero of cosine of theta. So you just plug in zero and you'll still get one. So this is great. This means then by the squeeze theorem, I can kind of reevaluate how I'm thinking about this inequality. And now instead of having it written like this, after evaluating the limits, I, I'm still trying to find the limit of the middle part here. But now if I've evaluated the limits of the two sides, we can totally see what the middle part's got to be. This, exactly what we were trying to prove, the limit is theta approaches zero of sine of theta over theta equals one. All right, so bring in the music. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> okay, I just, I thought that was a really great result, so we needed to have a party for that. Okay, <laughs> so, like I said, this video is, um, this video is just a proof. So I have other videos where I actually show you how to use this theorem in problems. So if that's now what you're looking for, I have plenty of examples with that as well. So please check those out. Any questions, drop them in the comments. And um, you know, guys, it's what is math if you're not keeping it fun? So hopefully you found this to be a fun, informative proof, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.